All right, thanks, Dwayne. Um, as mentioned, my name is Mark Anderson. I'm the water quality engineer here at the Grand River Conservation Authority. And I'm going to give you a little bit of an orientation on the Watershed Wide Wastewater Optimization Program, which is an awfully long title, so I'm just going to refer to it as the Optimization Program, uh, and provide you with some examples to demonstrate how, when we optimize wastewater treatment, everybody wins. I'll start with an introduction to the Grand River Watershed really briefly, a uh, little bit of uh, background on the optimization program. Then I'll talk about some of the benefits that we've seen from optimizing wastewater treatment. And um, then I'll get into some case studies and I'll finish up with some of the lessons that we've learned as we've gone along the way. So just to orient you geographically, the Grand River Watershed covers about 6,800 square kilometers in the middle of southern Ontario and we're roughly halfway between Toronto and London, Ontario. And just to give you some context, 6,800 square kilometers is about 20% larger than Prince Edward Island. Um, population growth is quite high in this area as a result of people pushing out from the greater Toronto and Hamilton area, as well as um, quite a bit of uh, population growth within some of the urban centres in our watershed like Kitchener, Waterloo, Cambridge and Guelph. Um, so again, just to carry on with the de description of our watershed, um, it's largely agricultural, but we do have 30 wastewater treatment plants discharging directly into the surface waters, uh, either into the Grand River or one of its tributaries. Um, the majority of those, uh, the dots on this graph, the graphic um, indicate the serviced population with the larger dots indicating larger populations. The majority of plants in our watershed service people, populations less than 25,000 people. Um, in addition to those sewage treatment plants, we also have four drinking water intakes uh, that use surface water to provide all or part of the drinking water supply for some of our communities. Um, on top of that, not only are we using it for drinking water and for carrying our treated effluent down to Lake Erie, but the river also provides critical aquatic habitat for fish and wildlife. It's used for recreational opportunities like um, fishing, canoeing, kayaking, boating, as well as hiking and camping. It's got significant cultural heritage value and a whole host of other uses and needs that are placed on it. So needless to say, there's, there's um, a keen interest in maintaining and improving the water quality of the Grand River, which is kind of how we get hooked into uh, optimizing wastewater treatment because they do have a, the wastewater effluents do have an impact on our, on our, drink, on our surface water and we want to see uh, the best quality that we can get coming out of those plants. So just to provide you with some background on the program, it started back in 2010 as a recommendation out of a, a program looking at wastewater treatment plants, bills and bypasses. Uh, and it was really the brainchild of a couple of early pioneers in optimization in our watershed, the city of Guelph and the county of Haldeman, and then followed later, uh, a little bit later on by the uh, city of Brantford. The program has continued to grow over the years and we're now including all of the municipalities uh, within our watershed that own wastewater treatment plants. The GRC is obviously a key partner in that, as well as the Ministry of the Environment and Climate Change. And I worked fairly closely with Aaron, who just presented earlier, um, to, deliver, to deliver the optimization program within our watershed and, um, and to help support him with his initiatives uh, on the provincial level. And uh, based on the demonstrated successes and the potential to improve water quality in the Grand River, particularly with respect to phosphorus and ammonia, optimization of wastewater was identified as a best practice in the 2014 Grand River Watershed Water Management Plan. <clears throat> I always like to throw in a definition of optimization just to clarify because optimization can mean a lot of things to, to a lot of different people. Uh, in this context, what we're talking about is not a one event or something that you do once. It's really a way of doing things that takes full advantage of the existing infrastructure and resources to achieve a high quality effluent that meets environmental goals economically. So that means a strong focus on people and their skills to ensure that they have the tools and training and the information that they need to make good decisions uh, to meet those goals. You've seen this diagram already, Aaron presented it earlier, but I'm going to show it again uh, just to talk a little bit about our optimization program and how it's based on the composite correction program, uh, which is kind of built on this, this 
performance pyramid. It was an approach that was developed in the U.S. by the U.S. EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, in the uh, 70s and 80s. And it really takes a comprehensive view of the wastewater treatment process. And in terms of evaluating the administration, design, and maintenance, those three boxes at the bottom, to determine whether the plant's capable and then um, of meeting uh, specific performance goals. And then really once that's been established, it's the day-to-day -day operations and process control by the operators that enables the plant to achieve the goals of producing a high quality effluent economically. So we're really focusing on those, those four areas of administration, design, maintenance, and operations. In terms of the benefits, there are numerous benefits. Uh, from my perspective as the water quality engineer for the Grand River Conservation Authority, a big one is the reduction in phosphorus and other contaminant loads to the river and ultimately down to Lake Erie. Um, because producing a better quality effluent obviously is better for the receiving environment. It helps to promote a strong focus on plant capabilities uh, and operations, enabling plants to better deal with variability in plant inflows and extreme temperatures that may be associated with climate change. So dealing with that, the, those variabilities. Um, optimization encourages a proactive approach to identify trends in plant performance rather than waiting for the plant to go out of compliance and then reacting to it. So it's really a very proactive approach to look at the plant performance uh, and try to head off problems before they occur. It can also reduce um, chemical usage, improved energy efficiency, reduce carbon footprints, et cetera, by promoting uh, an efficient use of, of existing resources and making sure that those resources are directed towards the things that really need to be addressed. More benefits. Um, it leads to an improved understanding, better understanding of the plant at all levels within the organization from senior management right down to the operators. And it helps to build strong partnerships between all parties that are involved. And that could include the municipal owner of the infrastructure, third party contract operator, the Ministry of the Environment and Climate Change, and the GRCA. Um, we're really promoting good asset management and trying to fully utilize the existing capabilities and capacity of the existing infrastructure before we consider building new infrastructure. So we're trying to squeeze as much capacity out of that, the existing infrastructure and resources as possible. And we're hoping to identify uh, an approach that might be applicable to other jurisdictions. So I'll move on to a couple of case studies that highlight some of the, the benefits that I talked about earlier. Uh, the first one I want to start with is the town of Caledonia in Haldeman County, and that's in the southern part of our watershed. The Caledonia Wastewater Treatment Plant has a nominal design capacity of about 7,200 cubic meters per day and services a population of approximately 10,000 people. It's uh, shortly after expanding the plant in 2004, there were some concerns with being able to meet the um, compliance limits with total ammonia nitrogen, uh, which are quite stringent for this plant. A consultant's report was commissioned and in 2006 and they recommended reducing the capacity of the plant, which would effectively limit um, proposed development in the community and until such time as additional infrastructure could be built at a cost approximated at about $10 million. So that wasn't necessarily a preferred, preferred way to go about things. So the county, brought in uh, an optimization expert, Dr. Dr. David Chapman, uh, and he took a look at this problem from a, a different perspective. So a, performance, a comprehensive performance evaluation was carried out. That's kind of the first step of the composite correction program at the Caledonia plant in 2008 as part of their optimization program. The evaluation suggested that the, um, the design of the existing infrastructure should be capable of achieving compliance limits for ammonia and that the nitrification challenges they were experiencing could be traced back to several factors that were not design related. So it looked like there was not really a need to build more capital infrastructure. So they took a closer look at, um, at the plant and found that the raw sewage had very low alkalinity and that the, the way that high-strength hauled wastes like septage were being handled was causing the plant to become overloaded uh, with respect to nitrification or ammonia removal capacity. So the township staff worked very closely with their contract operator, that's uh, Veolia Water Canada, to improve testing and monitoring, to establish a rigorous process control philosophy for the plant, 
and develop um, procedures within the plant for handling those high strength hauled wastes that wouldn't overwhelm the process. They also looked at um, other methods for adding additional alkalinity and, and other process control changes that they could make to, uh, to make sure that they, they didn't run out of alkalinity and, and shut down the uh, nitrification. So those op operational changes resulted in an improvement in effluent quality uh, and they didn't have to derate the plant and they didn't have to spend $10 million to build more infrastructure. And that's really highlighted in this graph here which shows the effluent concentration of ammonia. They initiated more comprehensive um, assistance and working with the operators to develop better uh, process control and um, identify the problem in 2010. The next month, uh, in July 2010, there was a non-compliance event which turned out to be a blessing in disguise because it gave them an opportunity to identify what was happening in the process during these events that might be causing it. Uh, and the one thing they found was the alkalinity was, was non-existent and the pH had dropped very low. So they changed their operating procedures to start monitoring alkalinity more often, adding alkalinity as necessary, et cetera. And what they found was uh, that those performance improvements have been sustained ever since. And the graph, uh, this data only goes until the end of 2013, but the graph continues to look like this up until this day. Um, so what was really done was to apply an optimization approach that really engaged the operators in an evidence-based problem solving and troubleshooting um, process to develop solutions that could be sustained in the long term. So that was a, a really good news story. Uh, the second case study that I'd like to present is for the Arthur Wastewater Treatment Plant in uh, the township of Wellington North. It's in the north end of our watershed. And this plant, uh, this case study is a little bit different. It's not quite as dramatic, but uh, it highlights a number of uh, things that, that I think are quite important. This plant, like the one in Caledonia, is owned by the municipality and operated by a third party. In this case, it's the Ontario Clean Water Agency. The Arthur plant has been operating near its nominal design capacity for quite a number of years. And in 2012, an environmental assessment was started to look at options for additional capacity. Um, the preferred alternative that was originally proposed from that, that study was to basically twin the existing plant, double the capacity at an estimated cost of somewhere between 15.8 and 20.9 million dollars for this small community, which is uh, quite a lot of money. Um, so we've been working with the township through the wastewater optimization program. And one of the things we're looking at right now is working with uh, the Township of Wellington North and the Ontario Clean Water Agency to determine the feasibility of re-rating the existing infrastructure. So trying to get more capacity out of what's already in the ground as an interim step uh, to get some capacity in the interim before having to spend the whole amount of money to twin the whole plant. Um, this may involve some minor capital upgrades and replacement of equipment, but it could represent a cost-effective way to achieve some interim capacity without spending all the money up front, as I mentioned. Um, so one of the things that we've done is we've been working with the municipality to try and raise their level of understanding and awareness of what might be involved, and re-rating the plant will involve several steps, uh, including collecting some additional information and data to make better informed decisions. We've highlighted a number of areas where um, information is kind of uh, not existent or needs to be um, better characterized. And one of those areas is flow metering of some of the key streams uh, within the plant, like sludge recycling and wasting rates. Having adequate control of sludge recycling and wasting is essential to having good, solid process control of the plant and to demonstrate additional capacity. Um, we also have a small project underway right now looking at um, collecting more detailed information on peak flows to the plant. Uh, right now, the only flow that's uh, kind of being recorded is a, a daily average. So what we need to do is look at what are the peak instantaneous and peak hourly flows coming into that plant. And that really helps to provide better information to design any kind of future upgrades or equipment or identify equipment limitations, in particular with respect to things like pumps. If, you know, a, a pump needs to be able to uh, provide capacity to pump the maximum amount of flow that's expected to come into that plant, uh, otherwise it's going to bypass. In the absence of measurements of peak flows, which they currently lack, uh, those designs would have to be based on highly conservative assumptions, which may lead to pumps and other equipment being uh, installed 
much larger than what they really need to be, and that has significant cost implications. Um, another thing that we looked at or that we've identified is the fact that the Arthur Wastewater Treatment Plant is required to seasonally store their treated effluent during the summer when the flow in the river is very low. They're discharging into a receiving stream that essentially dries up or goes down to a small trickle in the summertime. So they have to store that effluent for a period of months during the summer. And the ultimate capacity of those storage lagoons has been identified as another area where better data is required for long-term planning purposes because that could eventually become a, a limitation in terms of the amount that can be treated through that plant or treated for that community. Uh, in terms of the lessons that we've learned as we've been moving through this process, um, the first is really that building the optimization program and creating a community of practice is really about building partnerships and, and relationships with people. It's absolutely imperative to have active engagement of the participants for the program to be successful. Our approach has always been to promote evidence-based decision-making, which relies on solid data. So we've come across a number of examples where there's a lack of good data that's led to overly conservative design assumptions, compliance issues, et cetera. So making sure that collecting good data or data, good data is being collected is absolutely essential to make a good decision based on that data. We've had to adopt a learn-as-we-go approach or a flying by the seat of our pants, as Aaron would say, um, as to this program uh, because it is the first of its kind in Ontario. There's no recipe manual or handbook uh, that we can follow to just sort of put it together. Um, it requires an innovative way of thinking, trying new things, being willing to accept the risk that things are not always going to work out exactly as we expect them to, and being ready to learn from those uh, successes and challenges. There's no final report, uh, at least I'm not planning on writing one right away. Uh, we've been trying to build support for this wastewater optimization program as a long-term ongoing initiative. Uh, in order to keep the partners at the table and keep them involved and engaged and maintain program support, we really need to be able to demonstrate the benefits of being involved in the optimization program. And we've done that in a number of ways, including documenting successes in the form of case studies, providing annual reports on wastewater um, treatment plant performance across the watershed, and hosting workshops. Though the workshops have been really, really well received. They've been a really great way to engage people. We've had lots of positive feedback that shows that these events are a great networking opportunity for the municipal partners, contract operators, the MOECC, the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change, and the Grand River Conservation Authority to get together and share information, create a community of practice around optimization, and create a network of people that we can call on or rely on or draw from uh, if we have questions or concerns or, or ideas that we want to bounce off people. Um, ultimately, we're all sharing the same goal of protecting the environment and improving the quality of the Grand River. We're all trying to move in the same direction. And if we can achieve that goal by effectively and efficiently using our existing infrastructure and resources through optimization, then everybody wins. And that's enough for me talking. Uh, my contact information is given there. If anybody has any follow-up questions or ideas after the webinar, you can feel free to contact me at the uh, information provided there. Okay, thank you very much, Mark. Um, again, we'll open the, the floor, as it were, do questions from people who are on the line, and, and thank you, everybody, for your, your time and attention. Um, Right off the bat, we have one from Priyanka. It says, what type of treatment technology is used at the Caledonia and Arthur wastewater treatment plant? And has this work been done for communities with lagoon treatment systems? Okay, well, thanks for your question. That's a, that's a good one. The, um, specifically, the treatment technologies at Caledonia and Arthur. Um, Caledonia is a conventional activated sludge treatment process. So it is a mechanical plant, as is Arthur. Arthur is an extended aeration uh, package plant. Excuse me. Uh, so they are mechanical plants, those two, the two highlighted uh, case studies that I provided. But we have also been doing some work with um, Southgate Township, uh, which is also in the north part of our watershed, and it is, it's a lagoon system as well. Um, really what we're trying to do is promote best practices for the operation of these plants, whether they're um, mechanical plants or lagoon systems, 
um, and making sure that the operators are collecting the right information, that the information they're collecting is accurate and that they're making good decisions based on that information. So it's really trying to teach them a philosophy of kind of the, the, the best approach to, to operating those plants, whether it's mechanical or a lagoon system. The, the concepts are very much the same, although the treatment technology differs. Um, so it's identifying what some of the limitations might be or what some of the data gaps might be and trying to find a way to fill those and make sure that you're operating these plants in, uh, in compliance and in consistent, uh, using a consistent approach that's um, representative of best, best available um, technology and best management for those plants. Okay. Um, again, again, do you have other questions you want to add? I, I had one in just in terms of myself for, uh, is it possible to get this down to a kind of cost-benefit calculation? So if you've run all these optimization programs, can you demonstrate the, I guess, the dollar value versus having to do other options, either new capacity or uh, more efficiencies or extending the life of that? Because I'm just trying to think how you made the case to elected officials, um, again, when they're looking at their options. Is it possible to boil that down, or is that too much a reduction of the of the, of the process? Sometimes uh, it depends on the situation, and it depends on what we're looking at. I, I, I know we have tried to, as much as possible, we do try to put it in economic terms. Um, for example, the the case study at Caledonia, the the recommendation from the original report was to build new infrastructure at an approximate cost of ten million dollars. Um, the township, that was in 2006, I believe it was, or 2000, 2006. Um, the township has not built that infrastructure, so they didn't make that $10 million investment. Um, they, uh, they decided to take a closer look at the problem and, and really truly understand what it was before they launched into that capital infrastructure program. Um, the Arthur wastewater treatment example, Again, if, if they can uh, re-rate the existing plant and gain themselves you know, five or 10 years of capacity before they have to spend 16 to $21 million, that's a significant amount of money that they can, that they can be saving uh, in terms of the uh, uh, interest that they would have to be paying on that money because they, they don't have the cash sitting there, they would have to borrow it. So I. The economics is not necessarily my my area of expertise, but it's it's something that we do try to to present as often as possible. But the the case you make in general quality of terms makes sense. If you can extend the life of, of the current facility, even buy some time, so you have yeah, a if you to can, study, yeah, yeah, if you can push off those big dollar capital upgrades into the future, then uh, if it makes sense to do that, then it's a, it's a good idea. Yeah, and it might even, in the sense that it might you may still have to build, anticipating future population growth, but you might be able exactly. to build a, a different scale, a different technology. Uh, there's, there's lots to recommend that. Just a heads right. up too, if, if you look on the chat side, Sandra Cook from GRC has shared a great resource there, and you'll see the URL uh, on the right-hand side, and it tells you a lot more information about the optimization program. Some really excellent resources there, and clearly this is a, a great model that uh, I think needs you know, could be replicated in other places. So I hope that there'll be some, some future work with that.